Hello, my name is Blake Hall and I'm an application engineer here at Shunk. Today I'm going to talk to you about robot accessories. When we talk about robot accessories, uh, we're talking about anything in between a robot wrist and your end of arm tooling. This is an important uh, aspect of automation um, with outfitting our robots because often when we think about robots, we think, you know, certain brand, robot, and then a gripper on the end, moving apart from you know, point A to point B. But that's not always the case. Um, as automation has grown and new industries have gotten involved in automating their processes, we've seen um, you know, opportunities arise where compensation is needed. Um, when we talk about a robot picking a part, sometimes um, that part's not exactly where we think it's going to be. We need a little bit of movement because our gripper or our robot are built to be rigid. Um, so they don't want to crash because that's a safety situation. Uh, when they crash, they're going to reset. But sometimes that is needed. Um, then we also have the issue of having many tools um, that are needed to do a process, but only one robot. Um, we don't want to add robots into a process because that gets expensive. We'd rather save space, save time, save money, and then just focus on one cell. And by doing that, uh, we need multiple tools, so then we bring in tool changers. With tool changers, uh, we can have our tools set over to the side, use one robot, and either look at a manual tool changer where somebody is only coming in to take one tool off, put a new tool on, and the robot can continue its process. There's also automatic tool changers. So what those are gonna do is nobody has to interact with the robot at all. It knows where the tool is, it can go to the tool, detach, reattach, continue its process. We also have issues where, uh, you know, all these tools, there's uh, tubing, there's wires, there's a lot involved, but we might be rotating. When we think about that and we have a robot wrist rotating uh, and all of these components that have tubes and wires, they can get tangled up. So what we want to do is distribute that air and electric uh, signals through and have stationary rotation where on our tool end, all of our cables and uh, tubing is moving together. And then we also have our stationary end attached to the robot. And that allows for 360 plus degrees of rotation and we can continue our process uh, without any issues. Um, on top of that, we also have situations where we need additional safety. Um, so maybe our robot's moving in a cell and you've invested a lot of money into your tooling. So you do not want that robot to crash. But as we all know, some things happen. Um, something goes haywire and that robot does have a collision. So what we also have adopted is some collision protected uh, devices. And what those do is as soon as a collision occurs, they're gonna stop the pro process via sensors back to your control panel, and they're just gonna move that robot uh, back to its home position until either it resets itself or somebody else comes in and turns off the air warning. So uh, why don't we dig into this a little bit. Um, first, we've talked about a lot of tooling. Um, oftentimes, uh, we have uh, a lot of stack height involved once we start adding tools in. So what we've done as a start uh, in this process is try to design everything under ISO standard. What this is, is the industry has adopted mounting standards that most robots have implemented and then we've also implemented into all our products. So instead of having a lot of adapter plates involved in your tooling between your wrist, um, your compensation unit, between your tool changer, between your gripper, that stack height is going to grow. You're going to have to account for that during your movement. That's a bigger safety area you have to account for. And at the end of the day, that's a lot of weight that your robot and everything else on the end is going to have to accommodate. So we've developed these ISO standards into our products and we can just direct mount and even stack on top of each other. So without further ado, let's start talking about our products and give that a good look. So first we're going to talk about our compensation units. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, different products going on and that all just depends on what you're doing and what you need. So sometimes uh, you have a pick in place and there's uh, a part, they're designed to different tolerance. You just need a little bit of wiggle room to get in, pick that part. 
Um, that's where we look here. Um, as you can see, it, it just looks like it's a gripper. There's, there's not much stack height involved. We've just got this little compensation on the end uh, that uses elastomers just to give a little give. Really can't even see it. But those are there. Um, we've adopted these into our product line for our common grippers as well. So those will direct mount to our grippers, such as our PGN Plus, PZN Plus. Um, so you're eliminating more stack height. Next, we'll take a look at XY compensation. Uh, when we talk about this, a lot of times it's just springs that are driving that. But we've also adopted uh, pneumatics into the formula as well, and also have given our devices a, a free float option. So a couple different options for the, the same XY compensation. Here in the back, you'll see that in the XY plane, we can just freely move. Right now it's just in a free float state. Um, we also have our XY compensator up here. As you can see, this one's just kind of in a free float state. Um, so whenever you're doing a pick and place, any misalignments um, that you may have, unique parts you're picking that need to adjust a little bit during the grip, we can do that. And then also we can lock back to center. So you pick your part, you compensate however you need to, but once that process is done or you're moving the part, you can lock it back to center and redo the process. We also have just uh, Z compensation. So that's gonna be up and down. This may be on uh, your end of arm tooling. This could even be on uh, your tool nest where you're placing your parts. You just need a little bit of give. Uh, when your robot's coming in, you might wanna press. Like I said before, if you start pressing with a rigid robot and gripper, that could fault out your whole process. So we just give a little bit of spring give. Um, there's also pneumatics involved, so you can retract. Um, this also allows a little bit of resistance. So maybe you only need the spring and you don't need the pneumatics, but maybe you want to have a little bit of resistance when you press. You don't want it to be a completely just a spring force involved. So we have that option there. Additionally, we could do the whole package into one. Um, so we look at X, Y, and Z compensation. Here, you'll see you have the X, Y up top, and then you have your springs on the bottom, that's giving you the Z. Uh, with a couple of our products here, we also have, on top of our centric locking, we have offset locking. So what that means is you're picking your part, you have an offset position, you wanna maintain that during your process. So you could lock that into place, and now we can't move it. It's locked there until we go back and take off here and then we can free float again. So this is just a few options we have. Um, we also have devices specifically for insertion. Um, so those are just gonna give you a little bit of rotation, angular motion, up and down. Um, we have that as well. Something for all of your needs. So from there, we wanna come over here and talk about tool changing. As mentioned, often you have a lot of different tools in your process. Maybe you have large grippers, maybe you have small grippers, maybe you have a deburring spindle. Um, there's a lot that could go into a process. And as we mentioned, we want to put everything in a nice, clean, tidy area and just have that cell do everything. Um, so we'll begin with our manual tool changer here. You'll see there's a lever that you can just open, come over, take your tool off, place it in your storage rack, take another tool and come back, lock that into place. And now that's, that's stuck. It's not, it's not going anywhere until we come back, disengage. As you can see, there's additional accessories added onto this because you want to be able to operate your end of arm tool. So in this case, we have an electric gripper. So we're passing our power communication to the gripper through these electric modules. So once this is locked in place, we ha have made contact, we can open and close that gripper. From there, we'll move over to uh, a pneumatic gripper that is also on a different style of tool changer. This one is pneumatically actuated. So here we have flat design. This is really good for um, for pallet changing. 
So you have a pallet in a machine, you wanna get in a tight space, get in nice and flat, and then place your pallet. That's where this comes in hand. Um, it has very high moment capacity, so it can handle that heavy pallet that you have a vise on, you place it in your machine. Uh, we have this here. In this case, we have a gripper on the end. As you can see, it also has the electric pass through for our sensors. And then we also are passing through our pneumatics to operate this gripper. So we'll switch over first. We'll see that we can open and close this gripper through our pneumatics once this connection is made. Also, using air pressure, we can unlock it, change out to a different pallet, lock back into place. So now that's, that's stuck in place as well. Then we have another pneumatic tool changer. This one, as you can see, it's more circular, kind of fits in line with your robot wrist. Um, we have all these in various sizes. Uh, these are nice for our, for our display here, but they get really large, really small. Just depends on what you're picking and placing. So here you'll see there's a lot more going on with our tool changers. Um, we've got additional electric modules. Like before, we wanna pass through our signals. We also have tool ID, which is just telling us which part we have on here. So maybe one tool is a pneumatic gripper, so it'll tell us this is tool A, which is, we know is our pneumatic gripper. Uh, we might put on our deferring spindle next and that'll have a different ID. So from there, we'll see that we can lock and unlock. Change out to a new tool, lock in place. We're also passing through our pneumatic to open and close the gripper. So there's that there. Lots of different ways to outfit these for any of your needs. Um, just let us know for any type of communication, pneumatics, vacuum, we can accessorize it for you. So now we'll move over and talk about a couple more options we have. Uh, first, we'll take a look at our DDF rotation feed through module. As we mentioned before, sometimes your robot is moving 360 plus degrees. As you can see here, we're operating with sensors. It's a pneumatic gripper. We want to pass that air through as well. So what this is doing is keeping one portion in place, which would be attached uh, to your robot. That's stationary, and then we're gonna pass through our pneumatics and electrics from that end and pass that rotation through to our device. So even though this is rotating and there's no hose directly attached to it, we can still open and close. As you can see here, this is just a stationary model. It's kind of showing you the rotation as well. Finally, we'll take a look at our collision protection devices. Two options here, uh, one of them is currently sealed, it's in place, there, there hasn't been a crash, so your tool is on the end operating as normal. But if you come along and collide, you'll see that it's, it's taken out of place, it doesn't automatically reset, there's air escaping actually from here, um, and so it's gonna stay in place through its sensor, it's gonna alert the robot that there's a collision, and alert somebody to come out and put it back in place. And now we're locked back, we can continue our process. By using the pneumatic function, you can also uh, use less air if you want more sensitivity, more air if you don't want as much sensitivity. So a couple options you can look into with that. And then on the back side, you'll see here, uh, once a crash occurs, a sensor is gonna let the robot know the same way, but it's gonna spring back into place. So this is nice to fully automate your process to where we know there's a collision, we can move out of the way, but our robot can um, get back to its process without anybody having to come over and reset the alarm manually. So with that said, we've taken a good look at our full robot accessory range. As mentioned, um, there's a lot of customization that can go into any of these uh, and they can be used in unison as well.